Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Kenneth Tharp, I'm Chief Executive of the place, and uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to the Robin Howard Dance Theatre uh, for the 2016 Cohan Lecture. The Cohan Lecture holds up for question the simple provocation, what matters? It seeks to uncover a very personal response to this question from some of the most influential and creative minds of our time. The Cohen Lecture was launched in June 2015 in honour of Robert Cohen, CBE, the founding artistic director of the place, in celebration of his 90th birthday and his remarkable achievements. Robert Cohen has been instrumental in changing the map of dance in the UK, and it's no coincidence that he's often referred to as the founding father of British contemporary dance. Uh, please don't be fooled into thinking that Bob's dancing life is all behind him, because let me tell you that in the run-up to his 90th birthday, he choreographed two new dances. The world premiere of one happened on this very stage on his 90th birthday. Uh, last summer, he held two laboratories for professional choreographers and composers, and toured California, attending further celebratory performances of his work and giving masterclasses. Uh, most recently, he's premiered a new duet. He's been overseeing the romantic of one of his classic works on students at the Rombert School, and this summer he's leading another Cohan Collective Laboratory. He also plays an active role on our Board of Governors here at the place. Um, the fact is, he just can't keep up with these 90-year-olds, or 91-year-olds. Uh, <laughs> delighted to say that Robert Cohan is with us here this morning. Uh, we hope, uh, sorry, each year the Cohan lecture, lecture will be given by a different person and giving platform to some of the most creative thinkers from different disciplines and schools of thought. In its inaugural year, the Cohan lecture was given by Robert Cohan in conversation with Sir Ken Robinson. And I'm delighted to say that Ken Robinson has returned to the place today to give the 2016 Cohan lecture. Uh, I know that... <laughs> Uh, I'm just warming them up for you, Ken. Uh, I know that Ken, Ken, Ken plans to speak for uh, about 45 minutes, uh, but there will be, we will open things up for questions and comments from the floor. Um, and if anyone, uh, normally in this stage we do tell people to turn their phones off, but if anyone wants to uh, engage in, in Twitter, um, then please feel free to use the hashtag Cohan Lecture. Um, before I welcome to the lecture, let me say very briefly by way of introduction that Sir Ken Robinson is lauded worldwide as a guru on creativity and education. His TED Talk from 2006 on schools and creativity is the most listened to TED Talk, with well over 38 million views. The figure rises so quickly I can't keep up. In that talk and in his book, The Element, Ken tells the remarkable story of, of the world-renowned choreographer Gillian Lynn. As a young girl, Gillian was someone who didn't fit the mould. Her innate talent for dance lay dormant until an insightful psychologist intervened. She ended up studying at the Royal Ballet School, dancing in the Royal Ballet, and the rest is history. Dame Gillian Lynn is now celebrated worldwide as one of our most illustrious choreographers of stage and film. You will know her through her work uh, through stage shows such as Cats and Phantom of the Opera. And having recently celebrated her 90th birthday, she shows no sign either of slowing down. <laughs> Uh, and I'm also delighted to say that Dame Julian Lynn is also with us in the audience. Today. Uh, clearly, with Bob and Gillian around, 90 is, 90 is the new young. Um, in relation to these two nonagenarians, Second Robertson is a real and uh, is a mere whippersnapper. Um, in his youthful exuberance, Ken is one of the busiest people I know. He is, a, he is tireless in his advocacy for the fundamental need for the arts and for creative learning to be at the heart of every young person's education. He travels worldwide in between writing books such as The Element and Out of Our Minds, and last year he published his latest book, Creative Schools, all of which are available in a good bookshop near you or in our theatre bar afterwards. Uh, the arts spark our imagination but they also connect us deeply to ourselves, as well as to others, and to the world around us. The arts help us to embrace the full richness of our humanity, and no one knows this better than our speaker. Through his advocacy, his writing, his talks, his insights, and uh, not to forget his inimitable, inimitable sense of humour, he inspires hundreds and thousands, indeed millions, of others all over the world to become champions for creative learning. 
These are just some of the reasons why we are very proud to have Sir Ken Robertson as a patron of the place. Uh, we are so glad you're here with us, Ken, in London and here at the place this morning to give the 2016 Cohen Lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to Sir Ken Robertson. She told me that story I told in the TED talk over lunch one day uh, when we were, I think, both working on the Council for Dance Education and Training. And I just tucked it away, and I just thought, this is a fantastic example of, of what we're talking about how education is based on a very narrow conception of ability, and many brilliant people go through education thinking they're not. And it's not that they're not, it's just the system isn't sufficiently encompassing and broadly based to recognize the multitude of forms of talent that people have. In America currently, something like 30% of kids who start the ninth grade in high school don't complete the 12th grade. About 7,000 kids a day in America, I live in America, by the way, um, about 7,000 kids a day leave high school prematurely. I don't mean before four o'clock, I mean they, they, they just go home with me. Uh, no, they, they don't graduate. I'm always keen to avoid the term dropout. I really dislike the term dropout, because it sounds like, if you call somebody a dropout, that they fail the system. I think if 30% of kids can't stick it, uh, I think we should be recognized the system has failed them. If you ran a business and you lost 30% of your customers every year, you might wonder whether it was these stupid customers or your business model. And I know uh, from my own experience how many kids who are thought to be ineducable actually are perfectly capable of being educated and want to be if the system is adapted to them. So I have politicians all the time uh, around the world. You know, I meet them, I harass them, I follow them home. And, uh, and you know, they often say, you know, what can we do to solve these problems in education? Of, lack of motivation, lack of engagement, of depression, of anxiety, of stress, uh, of non-graduation. And part of my answer is, stop causing them. You know, if you change the system, these problems tend to go away. And this is why I was very keen to talk to you today about the importance of dance. Um, I, I, I gave this talk in 2006 at uh, the TED conference. It wasn't supposed to go online at the time, it went on subsequently. Um, and I've told the story about you know, Gillian's experience at school at the end of it, and uh, as uh, Ken had said, it's become a very popular talk. I mean, it is terrific. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's not appear to be baffled by this. It's <laughs> frankly extraordinary. <laughs> um, no, but um, I, I told the story, and it, it's now been seen, I think it's been viewed online, um, it's about 40 million times. But it gets shown in events like this, so probably the number of people who've seen it is a lot more. That's in about 150 countries. Um, the reason I'm saying that is because clearly the message resonates. It, it isn't just those of us in the room this morning who think this is important. There are meetings like this happening all over the planet. There are people in all kinds of communities. Dance, music, the arts, science, technology, maths. Uh, all of whom believe that education is being forced down the wrong path and it's vitally important we uh, we rehumanize education for the sake of our children, for the sake of our communities. Um, 
During the course of that talk, I, meant, I talked about how um, we tend to educate people from the neck up, which we do. And dance has always seemed to me to be the test case. In most school systems, it's right at the bottom of the food chain. Uh, it's thought by many people just not to be very important. It's always, well, it's discretion, you do it if you like. You know, it's terribly important, of course, we encourage you. Um, but it's not in the centre of education in the way that mathematics is, or science, or technology. And I, I made a comment about this. Anyway, a few, uh, about a year ago, I was being interviewed by Sarah Montague at the BBC. Uh, I'm very important. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is an amazing experience for you. Thank you. <laughs> I wish I was sitting up there with you, honestly. <laughs> Bathing in this as you are. <laughs> she took me back to my old school. Um, uh, it, was, it was great. I, I really like her. I think she's, she's a really fantastic interviewer. Very smart. Anyway, during the course of the interview, she said, so, but in this talk you gave to Ted, you said that dance is as important as mathematics. I said, that's right. And she said, you can't be serious. I said, but I am serious. Of course it's as important as mathematics. Um, anyway, I, uh, a couple of months later, there was an article in the Atlantic magazine about how dance is being used to promote empathy and compassion in some of the most difficult, violent schools in the United States. Los Angeles, uh, Detroit, and uh, in New York. It's through a program called um, Dancing Classrooms, where they bring ballroom dancing into schools, having a fantastic impact. So I tweeted this. I tweet from time to time. I might tweet in a moment. <laughs> and I tweeted uh, that, there we go, dance is as important as math. And I got a lot of uh, positive responses, but also quite a few negative ones. Um, I thought I'd just read you some of the negative ones. <laughs> um, <laughs> what I'm talking about these uh, is how they, you know, really, we're just going to save you an awful lot of time. Uh, this one, one guy treated, uh, I, so I, I said, I'm going to give a talk, when I was asked to give the talk for this, this year's Bob Crowhead lecture, I said to Kenneth, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how dance is as important as maths. Uh, so I treated that. And so this guy treated, isn't that going to be one of the shortest two-word kind of lectures ever? It isn't. <laughs> That then, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> so you're saving off a lot of time. Apparently, it's not. So um, this other guy simply said, "Can dance is not as important as maths." Okay. Um, some of them got a bit more um, ironic. Fortunately, the skills of reading calendars aren't as important as nailing a decent rumba. <laughs> this guy said. Uh, this other person tweeted, uh, "So what? Telephones are more important than bananas." <laughs> Ants are not as important as toilet ducks. <laughs> Paper clips are more important than elbows. <laughs> well, at least that's a creative response, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the clear implication is you've lost your mind. <laughs> you're comparing things that are not comparable, and uh, you're being ridiculous. And um, this woman said, uh, Helen Williams, <clears throat> she, well, I she's a mathematician, she said, Is that so? When I said dance is important as math, is that so? Who says? Um, uh, important for what and to whom? By the way, I'm a maths teacher. <laughs> well, that's the question I want to ask. Who says? The quick answer to that? Me. <laughs> and, and so say all of us, I think, and many other people besides, and have done for a very long time, since the beginning of education. Uh, and way back before the beginning of mass systems of education, people have understood, realised, and promoted the idea that dance is as important as other core disciplines in education. The fact that we've lost sight of it in the growth of public systems of education shouldn't dis distract from the fact that there's a great body of evidence to show that it actually is. Um, but the question then is, important in what way and for whom? Um, and, and that's what I want to talk a bit about. Um, the, the key thing I want to say is I'm not arguing against mathematics, obviously not. Mathematics is a beautiful discipline. It, 
shot through with beautiful concepts and ideas. Years ago, when I, I worked at Warwick University, I spoke to a professor of pure mathematics uh, on several occasions, not just once. And I asked him how you would um, assess a PhD of pure mathematics. I'd never seen one. Um, so uh, I, 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 said, I said, how long are they? He said, well, they vary. He said, we saw, I saw one recently, it was 26 pages of maths. You know, page after page after page of maths. You know, with equals at the end. <laughs> I imagine I've not seen one. I mean, we're talking hard maths, obviously. You know, we're talking remainders and stuff like that. <laughs> so, so I said, um, well, how do you assess one? I mean, presumably it's right. You'd be annoyed, wouldn't you? <laughs> Spend five years doing a PhD in pure math, it comes back wrong. <laughs> See me. <laughs> he said, no, they're normally right. Normally. <laughs> I said, how do you assess one? Uh, he said, there are two criteria. The first is originality. It has to break new ground. In other words, it's how creative it is. Not in the sense of being fanciful, detached from reality, but how, how much it contributes to our understanding or reshapes our knowledge of, of mathematical ideas and concepts. And, but the second one I loved just as much. He said it's aesthetic. I said, why does that matter? He said, because there's a very um, strong belief among mathematicians that mathematics is the purest way we have of describing the truths of nature. And since nature is inherently beautiful, the more elegant the proof, the more likely it is to be true. It's an intuitive test of truth. And every mathematician I've spoken to since has said that's true. What they are drawn to is the sheer beauty, profundity, and depth of mathematics and its liberating capacity for the human mind. And one of my sadness is when we ran the All Our Futures Commission in the UK, and Lord Stones here is on that commission, uh, was that maths themselves, mathematicians themselves, regret how education has become so standardized and pressured and reduced to a series of tests. So, so far from being a critic of mathematics, I'm a great advocate for mathematics, and not least because it's part of the great creative adventure of the human mind. And it's intimately connected as well to the dynamics and rhythms of dance, as any dancer will tell you. Um, so it's not an argument against maths, it's an argument for equity and quality across the curriculum so when um, my, Twitter, my Twitter critic said, important to him, let me be clear about it, I'm talking about the importance of dance, the equal importance of dance within a broad arts curriculum in the general education of every child. I think it is important in the general education of every child as languages, mathematics, sciences, the humanities. And there are several reasons why it's so fundamentally important to recognize that it should be sitting four square with other disciplines and actually why it's becoming more urgent than it should be. If anything, the problems in education aren't multiplying. If the current system were working, people might feel smug in sitting back and say, look, we're doing fine without dance and the other arts. It turns out we're not. Um, so I want to explain why I think it's important and, and set a framework for the conversation we're going to have in a minute. I was very, I was very much reminded, Joe, when I was reading these tweets, and other people who say, come on, you can't be serious, um, of that old aphorism that is sometimes attributed uh, to Frederick Nietzsche, but there's no, no, nobody can trace they actually did ever say it. Uh, it's also been attributed to George Carlin and all kinds of other people since, but it, it's, there's an essential truth in, in it, whoever did say it and how it originated. But you remember it, it said, and those who were seen dancing were thought insane by those who could not hear the music. And when people criticize the place of dance, or misunderstand it, or say foolish things, like reading a calendar is more important than nailing a rumba. It's frankly because they haven't thought about it, and in the conceptual sense, when they talk about dance, they can't hear the music. They don't know what this beat is that we're talking about and what we're trying to follow. Um, so, before I say anything more about it, I want to show you some examples of dance. This won't take long. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to edit it out of the final video, if that's all right. But, uh, I thought it's a bit silly, but keep talking about dance without sharing some 
you know, like what is it we're talking about? Because uh, dance is one of those things, when you say dance, people have the ideas come into their head and they, they think it's just that. So let me just show you this anyway. Um, it's a little collage we put together. <coughs> I'm sure this is. What's going on? By the way, <laughs> um, when I was putting this together during the week, uh, I was looking at this title page and I, uh, I have a technician, you know, come on. And <laughs> staff, I'm talking staff. <laughs> and we, uh, I, I, I said, I said, can you take the font down a bit? Can you do this? Can you change the font? And it, it, it got back on this. I said, that's fantastic, perfect, absolutely great. And I was just checking this morning, having a cup of coffee, just running through this. And I suddenly realized what, what I'd actually said was why maths is as important as dance. A complete matter from. So we hurried this morning and changed it back to what it should be. You don't even get so close up, can't you? To a thing, you don't even see it. And plus, that's the talk I'm giving at the Maths Institute next week. So, <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, I don't know what you'd add or subtract. It's just a flavor of the multiple varieties and forms of fantasy. But we could have put together uh, a compilation that would go on for an hour and a half or two. And Kurt said, well, you didn't have that in yet. This is the thing. Dance isn't some esoteric, um, uh, purely professional activity. It's deep in the heart of human culture. Uh, dance is a feature of every culture, everywhere throughout history. Uh, it covers multiple genres, multiple styles. It's constantly evolving. It's constantly digging deep into its roots and traditions. It's professional. It's um, recreational. It's sacred. It covers every form of social purpose. Very hard to define it. Um, the best shot I, I can make at the moment, but I'm open to conversation about it, is say something like dance is the expression of relationships, feelings, and ideas through physical movement and rhythm. But you, you may have a better definition than that. It's hard to pin down. But my point is nobody invented dance. It wasn't brought into being by a grant from the Arts Council. Uh, it, it's not dependent on being in the national curriculum. It's at the very pulse of humanity, that people move, that we're embodied creatures, and that we respond to the rhythms of our bodies and of the world around us. It's education's loss that it's not recognized and included as an essential part of education. But it's everywhere. It ought to be at the heart of education for reasons I'll come on to. Um, but dance is everywhere and it's for everyone. Why should it be an education? Well, um, it's important to be clear what education is about. See, the reason I want to start with that little baby at the beginning is that there's an important difference between learning and education. Kids love to learn. I mean, that child there wasn't on a training program for dance. It just comes out. <laughs> you know, the, the issue is how do we keep that child dancing uh, rather than stop them dancing when they get to school? How do we cultivate that exuberant vitality and capacity for dance that's present in all of us? Um, children love to learn. They have a vast appetite for learning. I mean, think of how much kids learn in the first couple of years of life. Uh, children, that child there will probably, by the age of 18 months, be speaking. Uh, age of three will be fluent, maybe in a couple of languages, actually, according to where they're brought up and what they're exposed to. The thing about language, just to take a case in point, is that nobody teaches kids to speak. You couldn't. It's just far too complicated. You know? They just learn it. I mean, if you're a parent, you didn't teach your child to speak, you wouldn't have the time and they wouldn't have the patience. You know, you don't reach a point where you sit your child down at the age of 18 months and say, look, we need to talk. <laughs> you know, or more specifically, you do. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this is how it's going to work. You probably notice your father and I making all these noises the past 18 months. And, you know, some of them are names of things. We call them nouns. There'll be 5,000 of them you need to pick up uh, before you're three. Uh, other, other noises are not names of things. They're names of what you do with things. We call them verbs. And if you modulate your voice, you'll be able to say what you have done and what you will do. And don't worry about the subjunctive. Honestly, nobody gets it. <laughs> what gets in the way of children's learning, sadly, eventually, where they start to lose interest in learning, is not long after we start to educate them. And I don't say this in criticism of schools or teachers. I've spent my life advocating on behalf of teachers and schools. But there is something in the rhythm, dynamics, and patterns of formal education which jars with the natural appetite for learning for many people. Not everybody, but for many people. And it's why, quite early on in their careers, kids will start to look listless and bored. And it's getting worse with this dreadful culture of standardized testing, uh, where we're sitting children down day after day and subjecting them to this numbing diet of tests and of information downloading, and then wonder why they're fidgeting. I mean, teachers don't wonder why they're fidgeting. Uh, politicians wonder why they fidget. The drug companies are thrilled that they're fidgeting. <laughs> so what's it, Jason? Um, I, uh, as Kenneth said, I published a, uh, a book uh, recently uh, where I try to go into this, but I just want to say that everything I've got to say about dance is derivative from all the wonderful work that's been done before and the extraordinary scholarship that already exists in the field of dance education. There are scholars all over the world uh, who've been researching dance in all its forms, writing about it, and joined now not just by dance scholars, but by psychologists, by cognitive scientists. There's a body of evidence building up around us about the essential nature and importance of dance in our lives, and therefore, 
in education. One of the most recent uh, is uh, this book here that came out last year um, by Charlotte Spendler and uh, Nielsen and Stephanie Burridge. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. Uh, it, it looks at dance in all kinds of settings, not just um, dance in, in education, but the importance and nature of dance and its value and impact in, in conflict zones. There's a whole chapter in there on the use of dance to reconcile conflicts uh, in the occupied Palestinian territories, for example. There are um, examples of dance in schools where have been disrupted by violence and bullying. Uh, you know, dance is not some um, uh, recreational activity that takes part just among people who feel it would be a nice thing to do for the evening. Uh, dance has proved itself time and time again at the very cutting edge of uh, human conflict and social change. And if you're interested, there's a whole, I say, battery here of, of uh, studies and research to support that idea. And I was thrilled and delighted when they asked me to write the forward for it. Um, but uh, I do recommend it. But a lot of this was also set down in various forms in a fantastic report uh, that came out in, in 1980, I think it was, um, by uh, Peter Brinson, who uh, used to work, uh, he ran the Gulbenkian Foundation. Um, this was a comprehensive look at dance education and training in Britain, uh, which again built on work around the world. So uh, we stand here on the, on, in a tradition that stretches back a long way of, um, of, of the repetition of the importance of dance, truthfully. In this report, Peter Brinson's committee concluded that the importance of dance in schools has yet to be recognized. You know, this is 40 years ago, and, and so it goes on. But this is a, a wonderful report from the Gulbenkian, I do recommend it, and as time's short, I'm not gonna go into it, but I'm saying that if you're new to the field, there's a huge amount of scholarship and research to draw from. Um, after people see so these TED Talks I gave, various people said to me, you know, this is great, you know, you tell us what the problems are, you don't tell us what the answer is to have more creative schools, and I have various responses. I mean, one of them is it's 18 minutes, you know, give me a break. But I have been around education for a long time. Actually, it was funny. I was in, I thought it was funny. I was in, we'll find out in a minute, won't we? <laughs> what do you think? Uh, but I was in uh, Grand Valley State University uh, last year, the year before. Do you care when it was? <laughs> I can check it. I was there to speak to all the students, and over lunch, one of the faculty said to me, you've been at this a long time, haven't you? I said, what's that? He said, trying to change education. I said, I have yet. He said, what is it, eight years now? Ooh. I said, eight years, how do you mean? He said, you know, since that TED talk. I said, yes, but I was alive before that. <laughs> <laughs> that was just a moment, really. And I have, I've been working in education my entire professional life in all kinds of incarnations. So I recently uh, published this, this, this here book, this is the American paperback, um, to set out what you would do, I mean, what, what, what's actually involved, and uh, you know, a lot of it draws on the. Uh, work I've done for a long time, including the work with the All Our Futures Committee that Andrew was part of. But it's to explain that, what, what we're looking for here and how we get there. The change really happens from the ground up as much as from the top down. But part of doing this uh, required me to say what I think education is. Education is one of those terms. I mean, if you agree with me broadly speaking on what dance is, what's education? There are different ways of defining education. It's what Walter Bryce Galley, the philosopher, called an essentially contested concept. It's one of those terms like democracy. We all think we know what we mean by it, but it turns out when we try to convince each other, we mean very different things by it, and not accidentally. Uh, I mean, what uh, you may mean by democracy is clearly not what Donald Trump means by it, uh, although he thinks he does mean something by it. Uh, in the American uh, War of Independence, uh, there was a huge, uh, uh, emphasis given to personal freedom and the rights of the individual, you know, to live a life of meaning and, and to seek happiness. Uh, drafted into the Constitution by the founding fathers, many of whom owned slaves. So they obviously didn't mean quite what we mean or would mean now by freedom, but they didn't feel it was a contradiction. It's an essentially contested concept. Education is like that. Now, one of the reasons we fall out with each other in education politically is we mean different things by it. It's as well to understand that. We have different things in mind and we want different things from it. It's not accidentally that we fall out, we actually are opposed to each other sometimes on what we want from education. So I thought it was important to say here what I thought it's about. This is what I think it's about. Um, if I had to define it, in fact I did have to define it, so here it is. Um, I won't read it to you because it's irritating, isn't it? Let me read it to you. <laughs> no, there are two things about this I just want to point out. One of them is that what lies at the heart of this is a perception, which I'm very far from alone in having, that all of us, in the nature of being human beings, live in two worlds. 
There's a world that exists whether or not you exist. It's the world that came into being when you did. Uh, it's the world that will be there when you've gone. It's the world of material things, of other people, of history, of events, of circumstances. The world that is independent of your existence. It may be changed by your existence, and I hope it will be, but it's independent of it. Uh, when you've gone, it will continue. It's what Robert Frost said, the great American poet. He said, I have learned to, uh, he said, I've come to be able to summarize the nature of human life in three words. This is the end of his career. And his three words are, it goes on. And it does go on. Um, but there's another world that only exists because you exist. It's the world that came into being when you did. It's the world that came into being when that young child was born. Uh, the world of our private consciousness, the world in which Ardy Lang once said there's only one set of footprints. The world of your inner being. The world of your hopes, your fears, your anxieties, your perceptions, your aspirations, your, um, your dispositions, your personal talents. The world that is essentially your world. The world that will end when you do, or change according to what your beliefs are on the matter. And my point about this is that education should be pointing in both directions. It should help people to understand the world around them. And for that, there are certain things that need to be in the curriculum. Um, but it also has to help them understand the world within them, the depth and quality of the world within them, the potential of the world within them, and crucially, the relationship between the world within them and the world around them. I, I go into this a bit more detail in the book, but one way to put it is the natural sciences, the natural sciences, you know, physics and chemistry and so on, are primarily concerned with trying to understand the world around us in its own terms. I mean, Einstein came up with E equals MC squared, but we don't think it was just his idea. It, it would, that would be true even if he hadn't had it. Somebody else would have had the idea. Uh, because he's focused on the world out there in its own terms. It continues to be true and will continue to be tested in his absence. And somebody else probably would have come up with it. But it's unlikely, isn't it, that um, uh, somebody else would have written The Rite of Spring if Stravinsky hadn't done it. Or that Great Expectations would have been written if Dickens hadn't bothered. Uh, the point is that works of art are essentially the product of the people who make them, whether it's a collective enterprise or a single enterprise. And I think the best way I can put it is that the arts operate on, in that relationship between the world within us and the world around us. The arts are ways in which we make sense of, report on, and communicate the qualities of our existence in the world. Uh, what it's like to be human in this moment, in this time, occupying these ideas. It's why I'm saying dance about relationships, feelings, and ideas. It's the exuberant celebration of being here now. And we look upon works of art always in the biographical context of the people who produce them. They, they take on a different tenor when we know more about the people who produce them. I know there's some structures who argue it's irrelevant. I've never really bought that as an idea. Uh, Jane Austen's work is still enriched by understanding about Jane Austen and where she came from, and the fact she was writing in her time and of her time even though the universal truths inherit. But these two things, the world within us and the world around us, are the, are the stuff of education. Um, education has, has become too preoccupied with the world around us at the, to the neglect of the world within us, and that's the heart of most of the problems I think our kids have in school. Uh, they don't engage with the world within them in the way that they should. They don't have the techniques, they don't understand how to do that, and it's into this space that the arts have a particular role to play. The humanities sit somewhere in the middle of this. Uh, it, it's. <laughs> The humanities should sometimes try, I mean, like economics, tries to be a natural science, but it can't be. Social sciences can't behave like natural sciences because they're about people and people's feelings. And people's feelings always go off in a different direction than one you expect. It's why J.P. Galbraith, you know, the great economist, once said that the primary purpose of economic forecasting is to make astrology look respectable. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's probably right. So, um, there are, I think, as I said, um, several related purposes to education, and I just want to put them out there as a framework for what we're going to talk about uh, collectively. Clearly, education has economic purpose. Anybody who says education doesn't have economic purposes is wrong. Uh, <laughs> that's my short lecture on economic purposes. <laughs> it does. But a, a big part of the argument for a broader approach to education is also economic. Uh, the World Economic Forum has recently produced a report on the, the central importance of creativity and what people are now calling social and emotional learning as part of the economic agenda. Uh, there's a whole economic argument attached to the importance of a broader curriculum. 
but it is an important one. Um, there's a huge cultural agenda for education, helping people understand, helping our kids understand how other people see the world around them, how other people occupy the world around them, the values and beliefs that they have that motivate their actions. Otherwise, we live in a general fog of incomprehension. You know, we don't hear the music, and people at a distance seem insane to us because we don't understand the beat they're dancing to. Um, and for this, we need a broad curriculum too. We need the arts, we need the humanities, as well as you know, maths and sciences and the rest. Uh, there's an important social agenda for education. Um, John Dewey once said, he said, every, you know, the, ed, the democracy, for example, is not a right, it's a practice. That every generation has to rediscover democracy. That's exactly right. A hundred years ago, Emily Davidson died under the king's horse at the Epsom Derby, arguing and fighting for votes for women. Fifty years ago, Martin Luther King was assassinated, arguing for the right to vote among marginalized communities. This year, people are spending millions of dollars in the American election trying to persuade people to bother voting. Uh, democracy uh, is not a right. It's something we have to earn and practice, and it should be given in our schools. We want our kids to engage with the world around them, not just be dependent on the world around them. But above all, education is personal. It's about human beings, real people, with real lives, real hearts, real minds, real circumstances, real biographies. And as soon as we forget that, as soon as we see education as essentially a process of producing data for international league tables, we're in trouble. However in help and interesting these league tables may be, I mean, PISA has done some good work in the program of international student assessment, but frankly, it's become like the Eurovision Song Contest for education, I think. And we all know what the Eurovision Song Contest has done for the quality of popular music. <laughs> so, so um, dance has important roles in relation to all of these functions. That's what I want to say. I just want to headline a few things about why I think this is the case. Um, I came across um, a, a program recently. I don't know if anybody here from uh, this program. It's a company called Dance United. Anybody here from Dance United? Dance United was a company based in Brantford, and they had um, a program uh, called the Academy, which I think was fantastic. I mean, it's one of a number of similar programs, but it's fantastic. Uh, the Academy, is a 12-week program of contemporary dance that is offered to kids who are in the juvenile correctional system in Bradford. So these are kids who have committed serious crimes often. I mean, not loitering. I mean, they're, they're done, you know, they're, they're in, in trouble. Um, and they have custodial sentences. So there are various options in the custodial system they can take. One of them is that they can be put on this 12-week uh, contemporary dance program, which culminates in a performance, as part of their sentence. Uh, in other words, they can be sentenced to dance. <laughs> what I think is amazing about this, these are the kids who have been rejected by the system, who have been spat out by it, who have not done well in schools, who are being engaged with the discipline that is least revered by our politicians the one that's thought to be least relevant to what we're trying to get done in education. It's a longer film, it's about 18 minutes, you can watch it online, it goes to the Dance United website. It's just a short clip, and I want to show you a very quick clip towards the end of it before I'm done. But this will just give you a flavor. But what's interesting, I just want you to note this, one is the difference in the responses to people in the criminal justice system who are astonished by this, and the skepticism of these kids' parents when, these, when they're entering into the program, and their friends. You know, it's like nailing a rumba, you know, really? I've seen offenders working on building sites. I've seen offenders joining in team sports. I've seen offenders doing offending behavior courses. I've seen offenders doing anger management courses. Contemporary dance, much to my surprise, has turned out to be the one thing where I've seen people make the most progress over the shortest period of time. Is that a real thing, like? Is that what they're actually thinking about doing? 
I was, I was going to sort them out. Smart, is it? It's not about becoming a performer, becoming a dancer. It's about giving those young people an opportunity to do something, to give them the skills to be able to choose. I don't like feet. <laughs> I don't like feet. Most of the young people that we work with don't make clear choices, they react. And this dance training gives them the opportunity to actually think and then make an action. You have to be able to be still before you make a choice, before you make an action. And this is one of the key things that the Academy teaches the young people. That's our warm up, yeah? Now what we're moving on to is learning something from the piece. They're yeah? very kind of fidgety, There's, or, or they're very floppy. There's not, a, they're not grounded. There's not a strength and a stillness behind them. And that's what focus is about. It's about actually stopping before you begin something. It's like an orchestra. It's the silence before you begin playing. And it's exactly the same in dance and I think in life. I don't think it would do anything to them if they just go up to a place where they just go to dance. What the young people get from being at the academy is structure. We're asking them not to wear shoes and socks, not to wear hats and coats, all the things that they think define them. They de duel as they go, so mobile phones, all the bling, everything. You're giving me a ring, two bracelets on your necklace. Sometimes they have to get, get over the fact that there are di different people that they have to get on with, maybe older, younger, different members of staff that they might not connect with. Off the walls! There is no room for them to hang out and lean against the side of the wall or sit down because they're tired or giggle in the middle of an exercise because they did it wrong. We're absolutely rigid and that is what I experienced when I was training professionally. The fact that they have to do their chores every single day. We have one in-house curriculum and a credit certificate from Trinity College. So if you want to stop that, you press the space button, right? Number six, how do we start to finish each exercise and what's the word we use? Focus. Focus. The support and the one-to-one -one and the nice studio and the food and everything else, they're all really crucial, but it's fundamentally the dance. If they didn't like the dance, they wouldn't, they wouldn't come back. <laughs> There are a couple of things to say, well, you know, what, you know, what accounts for it? Well, firstly, um, and it's really important to notice it, uh, we are embodied creatures. We do not live as tenants of a, a skull, which is irrelevant to our existence. We live in a body, and our body is central to our consciousness and to our perception of the world and of ourselves. The brain is not just up here, it's distributed throughout the entire body to our nervous system and the condition of our body, the ways in which the hormones and chemicals and vitality of our body flows is central to our view of the world around us and the view of ourselves. We are not incidentally embodied, we are fundamentally embodied. Uh, and you didn't just take my word for it. There's a lot of um, talk about, about artificial intelligence and whether we can reproduce human consciousness in machine form. I think it's a foolish conception, myself, uh, that we can do this at the moment. There's a guy I know who's brilliantly talented in science and technology uh, called Ray Kurtzfein. He's written a book called The Singularity, and he believes we're reaching a point where human consciousness may merge with machine intelligence, and we'll be able to live forever. You know, that we may be able to download our minds onto a hard drive at some point. What this totally misses is that we are physical creatures. And even if it were possible to occupy a silicon chip or some piece of DNA in a computer bank, we wouldn't be who we are. Um, there's a brilliant computer scientist called David Gerlenter. He's at Yale, a professor of uh, um, 
uh, computing science at Yale. He's also a composer and an artist and a writer and is recognized in the science field as one of the leading lights in the digital revolution. He agrees that this is a mad conception, that uh, our, our tendency to compare artificial intelligence with human intelligence is based on a fundamental misconception that human intelligence is bathed in physicality and freedom. And he, he puts this very beautifully, I think, uh, in a recent piece in the Times. He says, and this to be just captured, he says, as it now exists, the field of artificial intelligence doesn't have anything that speaks to emotions and the physical body. But the question is obvious to any child. Let me put it this way. I can run an app on any device, but can I run someone else's mind on your brain? <laughs> Clearly not. Our consciousness is intimately related to our physicality. The brain itself is very plastic. It, it evolves, it grows, it molds itself around the growth of our ideas, you know, our feelings and sensibility. If you engage people in their physical being, you begin to change their consciousness as well. It's an organic, evolving, and dynamic process. So one reason why this matters so much, why these kids are transformed, why people are transformed when they get involved in dance and other forms of physical activity, <laughs> is it releases the vitality of the human body and its relationship to our consciousness. And we have created a monstrous situation for many of our kids now by having them sit down in, in sedentary events, day after day, in our classrooms, we're contributing, I'm not saying we're causing, but these paths are contributing to the greatest epidemic of diabetes, of obesity, um, of uh, sedentary related diseases that's ever afflicted a single generation. And part of the answer to it is to give them more drugs so we can just perk them up so they can get through the tests. Uh, do you know 40% of American schools at the moment are trying to cut playtime entirely? Uh, they think it's a waste of time. I'm involved at the moment in a national campaign actually a global campaign on the importance of play and physical activity. We'll come back to that perhaps later on. So there's a whole physical agenda here of what we know about the body, physical conditioning, and why this is an important part of growth and development for every child. Why it should be central to our education systems. The truth is, our kids are dropping out of schools, they're disengaging from schools, partly because they're out of touch with their inner world and their own bodies and their own physicality. Uh, this is one sense in which the arts and dance in particular are important as every other discipline. But the second is emotional. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, far, far more is written in the literature about the impact and nature of negative feelings than about positive feelings. The history of psychology has been about mental illness for the most part, emotional illness. You know, hate, distrust, depression. Do you know, by the way, that according to the World Health Organization, by 2020, the uh, single most significant cause of death and disability among human populations around the world uh, will be depression. Depression. This is as the world is getting materially better off. Spiritually, we're becoming more and more depressed. Um, and of course, what it illustrates is what we should know anyway, is that human happiness, which is something we all want to promote, is not a material state, it's a spiritual state. I don't mean in the rigid sense, in the sense in which you are in great spirits. Um, there's a, a very interesting centre at Yale, it's called the Yale Centre for Emotional Health. And the guy there called, oh, I'm sorry, this is my beautiful assistant, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, Dr. Mark Brackett, uh, who's just run uh, a big event there, actually with Lady Gaga uh, at Yale, uh, on the emotional revolution to try and get people to understand again the importance of feeling in education. They conducted a survey, this is at Yale, of 22,000 high school kids in America. 22,000. 75% said the dominant feeling they have in school is of being tired bored and stressed, negative feelings. They asked them, how, do you, how would you like to feel? What do you want to feel? They said, excited, energized, and inspired. They were reviewing um, a program, this program called Dancing Classrooms, which uh, takes ballroom dancing into classes. Uh, they say in some of the most difficult schools in, in the country. And they found that 66% of principals after 20 sessions said that the children uh, were more engaged, they were socially more adjusted. 88% of the kids said that was true, they felt better about themselves and their relationship with the people in the school, and 90% of teachers said that, that the dancing classes improved the whole culture of the school. Uh, let me just show a quick clip from a couple of these principals. I have a young lady who came to Lehigh 
I guess in uh, November. And um, the file that I received on her was probably two inches thick. She, um, she was a fighter. She came uh, from an inner city uh, background. She's very street smart, uh, very angry. She, she was angry. And so when she first came, she felt that she needed to uh, prove herself. And that was to make sure that everyone knew that she was strong and that uh, she, would, she would fight. She was a fighter. Um, when we started the program, she at first didn't want to do it. She didn't want to participate. And participation is not an option. They have to try. She tried. And she had a natural uh, ability. And then the next lesson, uh, she came in and she had a little bit of a different attitude. We didn't have to fight with her to, uh, to dance. She just got in line. And um, by the third and even the fourth um, lesson, she was, um, she was transformed and um, she carries herself differently, she speaks differently, she is kind, she is respectful, she has not had one referral, not one. Um, her mother cannot believe what she sees. Um, it's, it's amazing, it's amazing. The program, um, the program is far greater than people understand. So Dan speaks to, properly done, to the physical development of children, to their emotional condition, elevating both, properly done. But it also, demonstrably, and there's lots of research to show it, has a tremendously positive effect on the social relationships in the school, particularly between boys and girls and between age groups. This last couple of quick clips before we get to the Q&A. I want to, this is from a school in Harlem, um, uh, a predominantly African-American school, but, but not only, uh, where the head teacher uh, also takes part in all the dance classes uh, as a way of, well, you'll see why. In all honesty, I began uh, actively dancing in the residency out of function. We had uh, too many girls in our eighth grade and not enough boys, and so I joined the first class um, just to help them out and have loved it and continued with it ever since. So what effect do you think your active participation has on the students? I think it's a great example, especially for uh, the gentlemen, that this is something that uh, adults and males uh, can actively involve in, uh, be involved in. Um, I think it's also a common presence for the students, and it's something that shows that I can be more than just a disciplinarian, um, someone who can understand the world through their eyes. What effect do you think your participation has had on the teachers? The teachers appreciate it. I know my eighth grade teacher has also joined the class, uh, dancing and participating as well. Uh, and again, it's, it's a piece of, this is not something that I'm imposing upon them. This is something that I view that's an important part of what we do. And I demonstrate that through my action and active participation as well. As a principal, I'm sure you're extremely busy. How are you able to make the time to consistently dance with your students? In terms of making the time to consistently dance with my students, uh, the one thing is you make time for things that you view are important. So if I can make an hour for a meeting, I can make an hour to dance with my students. So I just put it in my calendar. Twice a week for one hour, uh, I'm with my eighth grade. Uh, and I treat that no differently than I would treat an observation with one of my teachers. Um, or a meeting with a parent because it's all important and all part of building the culture of the school. See, that's really important, isn't it? It's about building the culture of the school. One of the things I talk about in creative schools is that we have developed an industrial model of education. Um, but I, I'm not alone in saying it, lots of people have, but there's the real metaphor, I think, or analogy with education is not industrial manufacturing, it's industrial agriculture. 
because that's also concerned with living things. Uh, industrial agriculture grew up in the 19th century. It was made possible by several innovations. One was mechanization, which made it possible to produce vast tracts of land with single crops, like potatoes as far as you could see, sprouts as far as you could see, whereas previously there'd been uh, always mixed, uh, mixed crops, which helped to support each other. The second innovation was um, the development of chemical fertilizer, which made things shoot up very quickly, uh, whereas previously they used natural composting. Uh, uh, and all this, uh, and then the third is, because these plants were never exposed in a different way, they had to develop chemical pesticides to protect the plants. Well, it all worked. It led to an enormous growth in output in industrial agriculture. The trouble is, it's destroyed soils across the world, it's polluted our waterways, and it's killing our children. Apart from that, it's been a runaway success. <laughs> uh, but it did lead to the massive growth of populations. Um, uh, organic farming is based on a different principle, which is these are living things, and we need to create different conditions for growth. Organic farming is based on mixed planting, uh, which removes the need for chemical fertilizer, chemical pesticides, because na plants naturally protect each other when you do diverse planting. Uh, and secondly, um, it's based on natural crop rotation and the natural fertilization of soils. Now, I'm saying this for a reason, which is that organic farming is sustainable, just as productive, and goes with the natural rhythms of life. It's, uh, it's ecologically sensitive, and it's fair to the, the people who work in these farms and to the environment. We've done the same thing with animals, by the way. We've housed them in terrible conditions, pumped them full of antibiotics uh, and chemicals, growth hormones to make them get bigger and fatter. Uh, but along the way, we've created miserable lives for them and terrible diseases, which we're now ingesting. The difference is this. Organic principles are sustainable, but, and industrial principles are not. They exhaust us and they exhaust the planet. But the real, really interesting difference is this to me. Industrial systems of farming focus on the plant or the animal um, because their interest is in output, like more, bigger, more and bigger. It's all about yield. Well, it, it, it increases yield, but it's not sustainable and it's unnatural and it's damaging the environment in a serious way. Organic farming has yields which are just as impressive, but they're sustainable. But the difference is this. Organic farming isn't focused on the plant. It's focused on the soil. The whole principle is if you get the soil right, the plant will be great, and it will be sustainable in the long run, and it will feed us and sustain us in, you know, into the far future. Get the soil right. The analogy with education is pretty clear, that we have uh, allowed systems to evolve which are focused on output, yield, graduation rates, league tables, more, 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 more people to college, more people through the system. And we have created a great cesspool of social waste that isn't seen to be relevant. But along the way, what we've actually done is we have eroded the culture of learning. Great schools know, great communities like this, great arts organisations know, if you get the culture right, the work will be great. If you create the conditions for growth, and it's why this teacher in the heart of Harlem is saying, I dance with my kids because it really enriches the culture of my school. And all these people say the same. They get the culture right, and the output will take care of itself. But you get it right by humanizing it and understanding what the conditions for human growth actually look like. And it's in that sense, too, the cultural sense, that dance is as important as any other discipline in school and should be provided for equally. But there's a last thing I just want to say about it. I promise, which is this. All these are inherently important to dance, but dance also contributes to other objectives. And uh, for the people who are treating me before this all started, they might just want to know there's a lot of evidence that when children exercise and dance, their math results improve as well. <laughs> there's, a, there's, there's a very interesting um, study was done in Naperville, near Chicago in 1990, uh, of 19,000 students where they all underwent a physical fitness uh, program, not a competitive one, getting themselves physically fit. Um, and as well as the inherent value it had, it improved all of their results across the board enormously. They learned better, they had a bigger appetite for learning, they were more productive at school. Uh, there's something called the Trends in International Maths and Science Test, TIMS, America generally rates at 
um, in that particular competition, right low down. Uh, oh, sorry, only 7% get in the top tier in that competition across the United States. The kids from um, this program uh, ended up being number six in the world in maths and science. And the study related directly to the impact of physical training and physical vitality. Um, there's a brilliant guy um, at Harvard called John Rayty who's written a book called Spark, Go Wild. It's part of a whole research program showing the interrelationships between physical conditioning, physical vitality, and achievement and engagement in school. Dance is part of that too, and also it's very specifically part of it. This is one of the last uh, things I want to show you, but this is um, they, the researchers of 2001, there have been subsequent studies, one in 2004, one more recently, uh, where they looked at the number of fitness standards that achieved in California and related that to their scores in reading. You'll see they go up. Scores in reading go up as the kids spend more time uh, attending to their physical development. It goes up in mathematics, in grade nine, seven and five. There are more recent studies which show the same thing. There's a direct correlation between getting kids up about moving, uh, which also affects their overall academic achievement. Add to that all the other benefits of dance, the social, the cultural, the personal, the emotional, and you have a very compelling case here for seeing it as four square with the rest of the curriculum. Um, this is a teacher, a very short clip from this teacher from the Virgin Islands who explained about dance. You know what? We tested in September with star reading, a very valid test on reading components, and star math. And just before they went home in December, we tested again. However, every single year come March, we do the ITBS or the VITAL testing, the Virgin Islands test. And every year with dancing classrooms, our fifth grade students have been our top scorers. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about the aspect of dancing classrooms and the academic lives of our children. Last year, their um, performance was at about 83%. Now, mind you, when I first got here the first year, they were failing scores. But last year, they got up to 83%. This was our second year. And this year, I am sure that we are above that as well. When they tested on the Dibbles reading testing this year, our fifth grade class was the highest in performance. They scored at an 85th percentile. So every standardized test that we are testing the children on, from kindergarten to fifth grade, the fifth graders, because of dancing classrooms, have been way beyond. So Dance isn't another problem to solve in schools, it's a solution to problems that we have already. And it's part of a bigger solution, which is to recognize the need to humanize education by giving the arts, the sciences, maths, technology, equal place, and to see the intimate relationships between them. Excluding these disciplines is the problem. It's the system that creates the problem. And when we rethink these conditions, the problems change or are solved or turn into advantages within the field of the arts themselves, but also in relation to others. So it's not an argument against um, the importance of other disciplines, but of the synergies among all of them, properly conceived and taught well. I thought you'd just like to see at the very end this final clip from the Academy, where some of the people are so skeptical about the program, uh, after the public performance they did 12 weeks since, their friends and families uh, were inclined to rethink it. Uh, it was just full of life, and he um, came back and said it's brilliant, I'm going again. He, he is a change lad, I'm telling you, he really, I, I can't believe it's my son. I feel like they've cloned another one, I made him good. When you're dancing, it's like, you're just dancing at you, you're not thinking about what else, you're just...
you have to keep an open mind and leave everything behind you, then it'd be like a new, new world. And those who were seen dancing were thought insane by those who could not hear the music. Thank you. Acknowledging the dance you did to get that to you. Yeah. Um, Ken, don't know where to start, uh, and I'm sure there are many people in the audience you've got who are building up questions, but um, I, I've got one, and in a moment I'm going I'm to ask Robert Cohan um, if he might like to join us because he might have something he'd like to respond with. Bob, do you want to make your way here? And I, I, Ken, I just want to pick up one thing. That, 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 that was a fantastic thing to see, that the Dance United thing, because in a way that encapsulates something which I think we recognise this as a challenge. It's not just about a perception of education, it's also a perception of what dancing is. And in the engagements that I have, you know, that my, my colleagues have with um, politicians, for example, you know, often the response you get is, oh, well, you know, it's, I've got two left feet, I can't dance, dismissed. Yeah. Or there's a perception that dancing is just about learning a, good, a few good moves to do on the dance floor on a Saturday night. And if that's not your idea of fun, it's irrelevant. So uh, I, I think what you said um, touches very eloquently to the fact that we are embodied human beings. We have this inner and outer world. One of the programs uh, that we developed at the place over some time was called Learn Physical, and it sought to address that. Um, we, uh, dance artists, would work with school teachers, develop lesson plans that involved um, them being physical in the way that they learned. And if you talk to the teachers about the effect that had on the children, the they would say that the children are totally engaged. They, um, they seem to learn and retain quite complex information. Uh, it seems to address different learning styles. And in a borough like Camden, where we're based, where 36 different languages are spoken, when English is often a third language, let alone a second language, it seemed to cut across all those barriers. Um, Bob, you've been listening to your lecture. <laughs> uh, I don't think you have to do anything. I think it's probably just on. Uh, is the microphone on? Yes, it's on. Uh, is there anything you'd like to ask or comment on? Well, I want to comment on this idea of being inside, speaking to the inside, and that's what makes you learn. That's once you, once I started teaching dance, that, that's the way I learned. And once I started teaching it, if I could remember to do that, to excite the people inside, teach them inside, there was no problem. There was no problem with what they were doing. If it's memory and just do this, do this, it doesn't work because it's forgotten immediately. But once you get used to the inner space and that's what comes out through your body, then I have this idea that uh, the people who dance or anything, they have made a contact inside themselves. And once they go to that place, that's all learned. It's almost like it's learned already. And you just have to go through the steps of remembering it, or the body does. And uh, so it's a whole different idea of learning. Which, which you brought out very well. I think that's, for me, that is the crux of it now. Uh, I still dance at night. <laughs> it's called dreams. <laughs> but 
but it's coming from the inside, and that's where doubt's always was. Mm. That's what I loved about starting with the baby. That it's, it's there, it doesn't have to be imposed on people, it's, right. it's, it's building on what's there. Yes. Yeah. I remember, if I can just say, I remember talking to, when we first met, a long time ago now, wasn't it? <coughs> um, I, was asked, I asked Bob how he really got into modern dance, and, and you probably have, maybe have to tell the story yourself, but you told me about the first time you went along to the Graham Studios, and how it electrified you. <coughs> yes, I mean, I've told the story many times. I just, if those who know Graham technique, you start on the floor, with your feet together, and I thought, that's strange. I, I expected to dance. <laughs> and uh, I was sitting on the floor, bouncing, and then the next thing is breathing, lifting the body up through the center. And in the middle of it, I was hit by lightning. It was an electric current going through my body. And it was instant, and I knew I didn't think it. I knew that that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Because the identity, the identification happened inside. Yeah. I, I told that story in a, a book I did called The Element, which is terrific as well. <laughs> it's like a set. <laughs> <laughs> but but one of the, the reason I asked you, one of the analogies I wanted to make is that uh, when I did that interview a while back with Sarah Montague, and, and she said, you know, but you know, you can't be serious. You know, but math is important for everything we do afterwards. I said, well, yeah, it is very important. And some people will go on to be mathematicians. They'll be hit by calculus the way you were hit by dance. Bertrand Russell was. Bertrand Russell said, I think when he was eight or nine, his brother introduced him to calculus. And Bertrand Russell said, I couldn't believe there was anything so beautiful in the world as calculus. And he devoted his life to it, uh, to being a, you know, a, a, a rigorous, professional, systematic, groundbreaking mathematician. Absolutely, some people will find their life's work in mathematics. Some in dance, you know, some in art, some in history. That's one of the reasons you need a broad curriculum. But also, some people will do dance at schools and maybe not dance much after that. They make, you know, the, the odd wedding, the odd party, here and there. But they'll have had the experience. It's like most people do maths at school, uh, never again do another quadratic equation. <laughs> never again have to figure out what the sum of the squares is you know, on the opposite side of the triangle. <coughs> never again do any form of calculus. But it was a useful training while they did it. It kind of was mental conditioning. And that's all part of the diversity that we need to address in education. It's why you need that broad base in education. And some will be like Bob and Gillian, the story I told you, Gillian, wasn't it, when you were, um, that psychologist, who imagine it was, said yeah, you weren't sick, you were a dancer. Mm -hmm. And you just have to wonder what would have happened to your life if you'd gone to somebody else who put you on Ritalin. If it had been a pill or something. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Um, there's, lots, there's lots I could say, but I'm actually going to ask if there are any comments or questions from the, from the audience, because I know time is of the essence. Uh, Betsy in the front here. Uh, just uh, hang on for a mic and maybe you could just say who you are. Uh, I'm uh, Betsy Gregory. I have worked in dance all my life in various guises, including being a dancer. Um, I'm curious because the, I think it's safe to say that the uninitiated in the education system will value sport way, way more than they value dance. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether some of the physical benefits you talk about with dance also are seen when the children engage in sport, which is obviously physical training and as well, and what the differences might be. Well, I'm, I'm happy for Bob and Kenneth to comment on that, but I'll give, give you my quick bit on that. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing about this is the, the, we're looking at relationships. Um, it, it's one of the things that was intriguing me in, in, in the West uh, that we've been trained to think in the Western mode that thinking is about making distinctions and seeing differences. You know, it, it's enshrined in our whole approach to logic and reason. 
that we make, sh uh, sh we categorize and say how things are separate. But there's an equally respectable tradition uh, in human thought which is about seeing relationships and connections between things. And yeah, I mean, there are many ways in which the physical conditioning that happens in dance, the, uh, the training that goes on, the need to be physically adroit and fit, uh, overlaps with, uh, in some ways, the sorts of uh, conditioning that goes on in sport. I mean, of course, sport's not a single thing. If you look at sports, sports people, athletes, you can virtually tell what sport they're in by which bit of their body has been developed. You know, um, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a feature of it. You know, people develop enormous muscles here and there according to what they're doing all the time. So it's not a sport's not a single thing it, it, either. But yeah, there are absolute parallels uh, between them, and some of the benefits that come from physical training and fitness and conditioning in sport also come through dance and vice versa. So then you have to look. So it's not it, that's not a competition, but there are some things that are also special to dance, and that's the point. You know, that's why I'm saying the social, the cultural, the emotional. I mean, people have feelings of sport, of course they do, but in dance, in some ways. Uh, exploring feelings is the very heart of the enterprise. You know, the, that sense of exuberance and joy. Uh, you, you see it time and again. You know, like the, the square dancing. Uh, not sorry, the, the um, uh, you know, the, the guy. Do, well, it was square dancing, I think, wasn't it? Where they were do the, the calling. Um, <coughs> the look of happiness on people's faces. The connection. It's, it's all those things added together. You know, the social, the, the cultural. The, the, the feeling of it, and also the sense in which it celebrates ideas and, and, and connections. <coughs> so yes, there's some overlap, but, but you, you can't get through a purely athletic curriculum what Anne also uniquely offers, so that's, that's my point. I think that's what you would say. I just... Yeah. 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 I know you did. Okay. Before I uh, got involved in dance, the only thing I found uh, equal, no, the only thing I found in school that interested me was running, jumping, gymnastics, in other words, physical movement, because that's what I, I never thought about it as something separate. I did dance uh, socially, but it was the sports that excited me because uh, I was talking with Kenneth last year about memory. And my earliest memories are about moving, movement, how I felt inside when I first could learn to go up a staircase. Mm -hmm. And that it was the actual moving the legs, which I can't do anymore. <laughs> that was what I remember, the sensation in my body of going up a staircase when I was like that. Uh, the, one of the big differences between sports and dance, I mean, what you said, yes, you develop the body, you develop muscles, and both exactly the same. But when it comes to actually dancing, well, I don't know if it's really dancing, frequently choreographing, get to a point where there's a boy and a girl together, she puts a hand on his shoulder, and you can't think what comes next. So I said to the guy, what would you do when somebody touches you? Now, if, if the person is, the man is uh, used to thinking physically, he will do a movement. If he's not used to thinking physically or inside, he'll say, what do you mean? I said, well, she just touched your shoulder. What would you do? Kiss her? Put your arm around her? I never thought of that. <laughs> well, you have a problem if you're choreographing. Uh, because well, what you have to do, what I feel you have to do, is give the information and get the information from the dancer and then put the two things together so that they can believe validly in their movement, in their next movement, until you have a whole story, a valid movement for the person who's going to do it. You don't have in painting, you don't have to tell the red to stay red when you put it against the green. But in a performance where there's an organic performance where there's a human being 
involved. They have to know what they're doing inside, emotionally, and we call it art, to let, let the artists come out. It was interesting, I just taught a class last, I don't remember when, last year, um, and I was talking about walking. I said, what's the very first thing that you do? You're standing still and you want to walk over there. What happens? And people say, I put my foot out, I do this, I do that. And I said, no, what do you do? Absolutely, you decide I want to go over there. What is the first thing that happens? And one girl said, I don't know. I can't move. What happened? I can't walk. She never knew that she was started to shift her weight. She never felt that. She never felt the motivation to go from her brain into her body. And it was a revelation to her that she starts to fall and she catches herself. And we do it more subtly than that, but it, the, the idea is the same. The motivation pushes the body. And that's all internal. It has nothing to do with being told what to do. It's an internal, habitual movement, like your little boy. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, what, one of the remarkable things about dancing in, in Bob's company for as many years as I did was that he, in the way that you just heard, he was always able to help would articulate both intellectually but also on, a, on another level, on a kinesthetic level, what we needed to feel, what we needed to do, what, what would the change we needed to make. And, and that was one of the many things that made him such a remarkable teacher. He would change us, not just in the way we move, but as, you know, more fundamentally, um, something which I'm forever grateful. Ken, I, I'm, I'm looking at my clock um, and, and knowing that we should wrap up, I want to ask you one question, if I may, which is, You've made a very strong case, I believe, um, uh, today. Um, how do we, how, you're probably going to say read my book in answer to this question. Um, <laughs> how do we, which I have, but how do, how do we change it? Um, uh, how, do we, how do we get, uh, I, because in a sense it's, it's the system that you feel is wrong, and, and, and the system that's fed by a mindset that is wrong. Um, I don't know, for those of us who might have sympathy with, your, with what you're saying and would like to do something about it, what would you urge us to do? And what the needs changing and how, how can we do it best? <laughs> well, um, I don't think anybody really put it more succinctly than Gandhi is supposed to put it, which is be the change. Mm -hmm. And um, when people talk about change in the education system, it's important to understand what sort of system it is. If you think of it as you know, a mechanical system uh, that is fixed and static, then you may well despair and think, well, there's just nothing I can do about it. That's the way it is. But it's not. It's a human system. And it was designed by people and it's, it's, it's moderated by people. It's enacted by people. It's what theorists call a complex dynamic system. It's complex in the sense that there are myriad elements to it. Um, you know, I mean, in, in education there are millions of people just in this country, then you multiply them worldwide. Uh, some are teachers, some are students, parents, uh, various agencies, politicians, uh, suppliers. Millions of people are involved in it in different roles, different capacities. Everyone of them waking up in the morning with a whole set of stuff in their heads and and going out to work uh, or being there and enacting the system. Um, so I always say to t uh, teachers or head teachers um, that the first thing is to recognize that you are the system, you're part of the system. And if you change what you do, you are changing the system. You know, for a kid, uh, for kids in school, uh, when the door shuts, if it does shut, you know, in the studio or on the classroom, if you're a teacher, you are the education system for those kids today. 
you know, for the next hour. You have to accept your role and responsibility. People do change systems. If you change what you do, you change the system for the people you affect. If you're, if you're a head teacher, uh, like that guy there in Harlem, he changed the system for the kids in the school because he changed. He did something different. And a lot of what goes on in schools isn't actually required by or even restricted by the law. Some things are. But a lot of what goes on is just habit. We just always did that. So we keep doing it. There are things we do in schools every day of the week. Like we divide in high schools. We divide the day up into 40 minute bits or that. that. You won't find that in any piece of legislation. You have to do that. That's just a habit. If you decide if you're a head teacher, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to organize the whole day differently. I'm going to do something different on a Friday. You can do that. It doesn't say you have to sit, sit children down in desks every day of the week. It doesn't say you have to get rid of playtime. And the reason people do it is because they don't see what these solutions are. You know, the fact is you get kids to learn better if you get them on their feet, moving around, doing things, as well as, you know, as the other sorts of study. You give them a mixed diet. So change what you do, that's the first thing. And then connect with other people who move in the same direction and collaborate. Uh, and form movements, that's how change happens. And it does happen, that's the point. That's the second thing, it's a dynamic system, it's not static, it is actually changing. There are big disruptive factors going on at the moment, the impact of technology. There are amazing schools across the country, amazing institutions like this one, doing fantastic work. Um, we have to be pushing and connecting and, and joining the dots together um, and have a, a common sense of purpose. I mean, for example, um, in America at the moment, I keep mentioning because I live there, you know, so it's, you know, I'm, I know more what's going on at the moment, but in America, every state in the union has been uh, passing legislation to approve same-sex marriage. I'm quite right, it's about time. Uh, but you know, I lived through the 1960s, I think, and you know, in the, in the, at the height of the alleged sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s, nobody was talking about legalizing same-sex marriage. It wasn't even on the agenda. I mean, people would still go to jail for that. But nobody thought that was even possible. Um, certainly not in America, certainly not in, in middle America, in the deep south, but now people say, yeah, come on, what's the problem? And interest, this is the point I want to make. Interestingly, this did not happen in America because members of Congress went on a retreat in Aspen <laughs> with some focus groups and thought, it's about time we sell this to the population. You know, we know it matters. Go back to your constituencies and talk everybody into it. That didn't happen. It actually happened because people across the country just changed their mind. I thought, no, this, this is wrong. This ought, this ought to happen. And it's a domino effect. In other words, the change came from the ground up. It was a shift in the zeitgeist, a shift in consciousness. And state after state said, okay, well, I, I mean, some are still resisting, but on the whole, that this is what the people want. And ch social change like that does happen. I mean, in the, when I was a student in the 70s, everybody I know smoked. Everybody smoked. People, I used to smoke giving lectures. I did used to borrow cigarettes from students in the, in the audience, you know, saying I'd pay them back out. I never did. <laughs> but, but, you know, here we are now. If somebody lit up a cigarette in this room now, there'd be outrage. Outrage, what, what are we playing at? But people did. People smoked on aeroplanes. In the smoking section at the back. What was that? <laughs> at the back of the aeroplane. Okay, there's obviously two rows back, you'll be fine. <laughs> what I mean is that culture, if I can soganize it a bit, culture, you know, one way of describing culture is the values and forms of behavior that characterize different groups. But another way to put it is that culture is about permission. It's like, what's okay? Where's the boundary? What's all right? What's not okay now? And over time, it's interesting to see the boundary shift. What was not okay 10 years ago is okay now. What was okay 10 years ago isn't now. I was watching an old... Um, uh, uh, program on YouTube a while back of a show called The Comedians. Do you ever remember that? It was in the 70s. But it was, it was, you know, it was mainly guys actually from the northern clubs. It was the most popular show on television. And the crowd with all these people cracking up. It was naked racism, most of it. I watched a Richard, Richard Pryor roast from the 1970s. And the stuff they were finding funny, they were cracking people up, you'd be arrested for it now. It was just so offensive to gay people, to uh, people of colour, it was, I mean, really, you can say that? If he said it now. But you, nobody quite noticed when it happened, it's just the boundary shifted, like, no, you can't do that now. And yes, you can. 
So if you run an institution, one of the roles of a teacher or of an artist or of a head teacher is to set the boundaries, like what's okay. And if you shift the boundaries, it's amazing. I run a whole program in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, Oklahoma wants to become the state of creativity. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a very interesting journey, actually, in the last 10 years of it. Um, but I remember speaking to the governor, and he said, well, if we're going to be the state of creativity, where will all these ideas come from? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, they'll come from everywhere. Just tell people it's okay. And they have done. From business, from schools, from everywhere. You just have to say it's all right. And then you have to make sense of the good ideas and the bad ones. But, you know, that, that's what I'm saying. You change the system by changing. And recognize that changes are happening. One of the big shifts is that higher education is losing its, its hypnotic effect on schools now because people don't just go into university, won't guarantee them a job anymore, get to be too expensive. Things are happening, technology is affecting things. Things are in motion, so it's having a sense of what you're trying to get to. And the other thing I always say to people is, you know, be kind on yourself here because these are perennial and millennial issues. We're not going to solve all this in our lifetime. You know, nobody is. It's not going to be solved like that. You can just keep trying to improve it. Try and make things better. Some things keep coming around. It's like gardening, actually. You know, it's another season. The climate keeps changing. You have to adapt to that and do what you can. Do things you think you can, you can sleep well about at night. You know, try and think it through and, and be honest and act with integrity. And, and you will affect the lives of all kinds of people without even knowing you're doing it. I still think about the teachers I knew. I still think back about my meetings with Bob and Gillian and the effect they've had on my life. You know, you hope to have have some effect on somebody else's life, but all you can do, it's, it's an organic process. There isn't some final end state where there's going to be a utopia thing, okay, we've done it now, now what's next? You, know, you just do what you can and be part of the old sort of thing, isn't it? Be part of the solution, not part of the problem, if you can. And, and, and actually the problem's rather urgent, I think, if you look at the big issues we face culturally and economically and environmentally. We can't afford to be part of the problem much longer, but change what you do and you'll change the world. Mm. In, in your book, The Element, forget, correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in, yes, in, the, clo the, element. <laughs> in, the, in the closing bits, you, you said something which struck a call with me and I keep coming back to because it seemed ever was, more... Was that only the last bit? Ever more, well, no, the whole, the whole thing was wonderful, of course. Um, <laughs> Finally. <laughs> there, there was a, you said, look, politicians tend to, when they think about education, there are three things that they could focus on. One is what's on the curriculum, and two is how it's tested. Yeah. And the third thing that you said tends to get forgotten, which is how it's taught. Yeah. And I think if you look at the last 10 years, you can see a huge preoccupation with what's on the curriculum and how it's tested. And it feels that perhaps we need to focus on that third thing. Uh, and, you know, I'd like to think that in, maybe in our lifetimes, we'll, people will be well, amazed well, and it, outraged that dance wasn't well, absolutely it, it, it's central what, to that learning. Be quiet. It's what <laughs> <laughs> I'm the guest speaker. <laughs> I travel to be here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's what Bob, Bob was saying. You know, when you're saying how great a teacher he, mm. he is. Yeah, that's right. There's, there's the curriculum, it's what, what we want to teach. There's assessment, which is you know, how, how to do it. But the heart of it is, is teaching. And actually, you can do away with the curriculum and do away with testing. You can't do away with good teaching. And if we don't get teaching right, we don't get anything right. And you can change it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Read the whole book. <laughs>
I come more and more to the conclusion that since the world's at stake and we're all actors on it, you have to you have to act the person who can do what you're doing. And if you do that, then you can do what you're doing. And you'll get better and better at it. You have to be creative in the way you think of it, from yourself. And then get more is no, that wasn't really creative. What? Just be honest from yourself out. We, we can't do that because we're afraid. So it's very hard to do it, especially in, in a class in front of 20 people. But that's the only way you can do it. You have to teach from what you know in yourself. And you have to be able to transfer that information. To, you can't assume that the people come to your class to torture you. <laughs> you can't assume that they come there to make it hard for you. You can't teach thinking that the students don't really want to learn. And this is, this is true of teaching any, any level. You have to enhance in a very simple way. You have to enhance what they're doing. You have to give them a little, little, little corner to come around and then they'll see and they'll be what you want. And then no, there are no problems. Once, once you can actually teach from inside your experience, teach what you know, and really teach it with, with compassion, if you can do that, you'll have no problem. Saying exactly that. I mean, if you if you change your practice, inspire your own practice, that's something you can do right away. But I, I also want to say I, a lot of the problems we face are to do with the climate that uh, policymakers create under which we work. Obviously, can, can we get them to take class? It would help. <laughs> would it help? Yes, we yes. would. Absolutely. Yeah. Because they're talking from habit. Yeah. And that's they're right. talking from a political reason, not from inside themselves. That's exactly right. That's exactly the problem. I, I, I find that people say, well, I'm, you know, like members of the administration say, well, I, I didn't do dance at school, and look at me. I said, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> look at you. <laughs> look at the state of you. <laughs> but, but, the, it's also important, that when I say it's a complex dynamic system, it, it, it is also at all levels. There are many politicians and policy makers, all of systems out there, who get this. And it's important to work with them. It's important not to dichotomize that. I get asked a lot to speak to um, non-educational groups, you know, businesses and others. I, I say I'm working at the moment with uh, Unilever on a, a global campaign around uh, children's <coughs> play and get, getting kids outdoors and getting more physically active. Uh, there are plenty of people in the corporate sector, the, the, the strictly speaking not educational sector, the political sector, who get it, but they need to be engaged. Uh, we need to talk in the way that they understand. Um, and we do need to affect policy at the top. The thing is they do shift over time. I mean, it is like the weather changes, never a fixed state. But I'm not saying well, you know, it's all easy, so just change what you do. I mean, that's part of it. That's what you can do. You can change what you do. But collectively, we have to try and change the climate as well and, and get a more, uh, a more equitable settlement so that schools can do it. And that is also changing, by the way. Um, South Korea, at the moment, is going through a whole process of political change to promote creativity and diverse talents in its schools. It's exhausted itself with this testing agenda. China is saying, at least politically, it wants to commit itself to more creative forms of education. It's going to be a long haul, but they're doing it. Finland has long been on this track. Uh, Scotland has a much more interesting curriculum, I think, than the English one. Uh, there are states across America who are relaxing a lot of legislation that's been dominating for the past uh, 20 years. So, I mean, things are changing. And crucially, parents have had enough of it very often. 
They're starting to pull their kids out of a lot of this testing stuff, and they know more. When I, I was I'm working on a book just now for parents, and I, I uh, put a thing on Facebook saying, what is it about schools that most concerns you? And I had, I think, 500 responses within an hour. Some very long from parents saying, you know, like, they don't get my child, you know, my teachers are complaining about all the testing. Things are moving. Um, I'm not going to put my spot here, but Lord Stone's here, who's on the uh, All Our Futures Committee, and we're talking about you maybe having an event at the House of Lords to talk about the importance of dance. I'm right about this, Antoine. There are people in the political uh, field who, who want this conversation and want to see the change coming. So we have to work with our legislators as well and, and vote accordingly. Uh, make, make it an electoral issue when education comes around. No, don't take it, don't stand for it. And, uh, and if we can get these changes locally and nationally, then, uh, then I think that we'll, we will begin to see conditions ease at the ground level, which is where, in the end, if it's not happening at the ground level, it isn't happening anyway. It's just, it's just a policy in the white paper, isn't it? But it also has to happen at the ground level. But we have to improve the training of teachers. We have to work with cultural organizations like this in a different way. It's just worth keeping at it, you know, and in the meantime, celebrate the small wins and the looks on your kids' faces uh, when you get it right today. Ken, thank you. Afternoon. Of course, I want to thank Robert Cohen, without whom we wouldn't be having the Cohen lecture. Um, <laughs> uh, of course, I want to thank Ken. Ken, the conversation about creativity and education. Without whom, there wouldn't have been the Cohen lecture. <laughs> without, uh, am I wrong? <laughs> The conversation about creative and education would be infinitely poorer without you. Thank you for being such a passionate and eloquent speaker. Thank you. Please do join us in the bar. Uh, there are plenty of books on sale. If you're lucky, you may walk away with a signed copy, but enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.